Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning study. Uh, um, as you can see, I put some things out there, added some things to this line, and we're going to look at them. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here this morning to study your word. We just ask for your spirit's presence as we open your word together. We ask that you can work upon our hearts and minds, that you can give us wisdom and understanding, a conviction and a power in our lives. And we pray for each person who's searching for truth, uh, that you can guide and direct them. Thank you for this light for our feet. Uh, may it guide us in our path as we continue to follow and serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. So um, as you can see on this line, I've added some, some dates and some spans of time. And of course, we're going to discuss that and see if, if this makes sense. So in the bottom of this chart here, I just put the dates and you can see the different uh, periods of time between these dates. So it's just a convenient way of looking at this. It's just from the calendar converter. So um, a little bit of a review, and then we will move into this. So um, when we look at this line, what we had done yesterday is we had placed um, the, the arrival of the first angel, its formalization and empowerment, and we had used Mordecai's dream. Now that isn't in Esther in the King James, but it is in the apocryphal Esther. And um, the thing about that date is it's the first day of the first month. In the second year of uh, uh, Xerxes, and the thing that makes that interesting is that we have taken that it's the first day of the first month in the third year of Xerxes um, that we have the 187 days begin. Right, so the 187 days of Xerxes' feast. Now you can see I have uh, between those two dates then 384 days, and that's just uh, an embolismic year. It's called a, uh, I think, a, what do they call that? A common embol, no, a regular embolismic year. So you have common years and embolismic years. This is uh, embolismic year, and it's a regular. You have also a deficient and a complete. Deficient would be 383 days, and a complete would be 385. So, um, and then, so I mark there as Xerxes planning. That's the planning that he has for this uh, stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. And uh, have the Julian dates there. And then we have 186 cardinal days, so the day that Vashti is deposed is um, the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. It's the third year of Xerxes still. And um, and then what we had done is we had taken these three uh, way marks and we had marked them as 9-11, 11-9, and 7-18. And the reason there is we know that 9-11 and 11-9 are related. They both are symbols symbolized by the first day of the first month. And so those dates fit well there. Uh, now, the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the year. So July 18 or the 18th day of the seventh month on our calendar would symbolize that 10th day of the seventh month. So I think that would be pretty simple to take that first message and apply it to that line in that way. So what I've done is I've taken the other dates we have. The first day of the 10th month, um, I marked as the second angel arriving. That's December 22, 479. And um, that's when Esther is wedded. And then the next date that we're given is Haman's decree. Now, I'm still not certain whether, you know, he starts on the first day of the first month and counting this. But we know on the 13th day of the first month, 
uh, they're going to issue this decree. So Haman's going to go before Xerxes, get this decree issued, and Mordecai is going to find out about it um, and uh, encourage Esther to do something about it. And there's going to be a three-day fast there, and then she's going to come before Xerxes. So that three-day fast is going to end on the 16th. And so it's the third day. So technically the 14th, 15th, 16th is when she um, come, she's having that fast and prayer. And then she comes before Xerxes on the 16th. That's going to be the 17th day, uh, the, the, the day after that, the second banquet day, that Haman's going to be executed. But when she uh, goes in before Xerxes and she has that golden scepter, uh, uh, place there to pardon her, um, that's going to be 66 days to Esther's decree. She's going to have this decree um, that's going to be issued. And so we know 66 can represent 666. Now the, her decree is a counter to Haman's decree. So it's the way that they resolve the issue is um, uh, to set a counter decree that the Jews can defend themselves. Now, uh, it's going to be 256 days from that decree till the decree goes into effect. And basically, both decrees go into effect, Haman's and Esther's, on the 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th year. Now, we know there is another decree uh, for the 13th, 14th day of the 12th month. So they, they extend uh, Esther's decree, but I didn't put that in there. I just put the March 7th, 473 BC date. Um, <clears throat> this date that symbolizes the Sunday law and is 793 years uh, prior to um, uh, March 7th, 321. Now, <clears throat> okay, so did I go through that too quickly, or does that make sense? So I just I went. I took the liberty of just putting those dates there, just to save us a little bit of time this morning. Does that make sense? The dates that I put there. Now we have some other things to do here. Um, so so one is we do have. We haven't marked, even though I put them as these way marks, we have to discuss whether that makes sense. So Esther's wedding is uh, this second angel arriving. So, I mean, that makes sense in the context that it's chapter two, right? Now, chapter three is is technically uh, what we call the, the Sunday law, but we're going to have Haman's decree and Esther's decree occur in chapter three, but they're just going to be the formalization and empowerment of the second angel. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to people uh, because we say, you know, chapter one is the first angel, chapter two is the second angel, and chapter three is the third angel's message. <clears throat> so, so. Esther is married to Xerxes. Now, now what we have Haman's decree there, but notice in this line, I put the 13th to the 16th. That is, um, we have Haman's decree, but I'm not really marking Haman's decree as the main event there as the formalization of the second angel. I'm marking the 16th day of the first month. In the 12th year of Xerxes because um, in um, in this story to me the primary aspect is that um, we know in chapter 2 there's this decree and, and um, or chapter 2 this is going to be the marriage we have Mordecai discovering the plot, which I didn't put in here, which maybe I should. Um, 
but we don't have a date for it. So, so I put the things that I had date for, dates for. Now we do know it says at that time, um, it says, well, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat at the king's gate. So I don't know when that is. So we don't know. Um, so when the virgins were gathered together the second time, what that even means. But we applied that. Um, so let's let's look at this. So I put these dates down here, but we know that there's some things that may be wrong about it. So let, let's go here again. <clears throat> so we have Esther's marriage, right? And that's going to be um, in this uh, verse 216. Uh, that's going to be on the month Tebet in the seventh year. Now, we're assuming then that that's the first day of the tenth month. Right, so that's, that's how we take that. Now, um, so the king made a great feast. It doesn't say how many days or anything like that. Uh, but then it says, and when the virgins were gathered together the second time. Now, we, again, we don't know what that means. But we use this, the second time gathering, to tie us to Millerite history. So that's going to bring us to uh, early writings, page 74. So I haven't put Mordecai's uh, discovering this plot on that line because I don't know when it is. I don't have any date here. And, and I wanted things where I had dates, but maybe that wasn't the right thing to do because I could put it in there even if I don't know exactly the date of it. So what should we do with this? So we have the first day of the 10th month. We know when Esther gets married. But now we have Mordecai discovers a plot. So if we look at this line, I didn't put it on the line. I'm just okay. now. No, so I, I have a I have a question. When we're looking at this, of course, this title saying Mordecai discovers a plot mm -hmm. is in the more modern versions of the King James. That is not in the 1611 or the 1769. Yeah, some different title. What do they what do they have it as the title? Or not anything? They don't have it. Okay. Now my question relates more to verse 218. Then the king made a great feast unto all of his princes, right? Yeah. So it references two feasts here. Yeah, we got a feast in chapter one and we have a feast in chapter two. I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, does it not say the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants? And then... In italics, it says even, and then Esther's feast. Yeah, well, I, I know they put even in italics there. Um, but the sign of the definite, because uh, um, this number here is the sign of the direct object. Right. Right. So that's why they put even. So that is, this is Esther's feast. It's one feast. So it's all one feast. It's not two feasts. Yes, this is the one feast for Esther. But he's making a great feast because of the marriage to Esther. So it's not two feasts. Okay. So that clears that up. But 
the alternate Hebrew. And he made a release to the provinces. And the, the release in the alternate is he made a rest. Okay. Um, yeah, so the alternate translation you're saying? Because well, if you say in Hebrew, it, it, it means rest. But um, Hanukkah. Hanukkah, yeah. Yeah, that's the word. Hanukkah. So, in a way, with this, from from 1769, King James, mm -hmm. is this Hebrew 2010 mm -hmm. a symbol for us at this time? Because what were we observing was occurring about 2010 within the movement. Yeah, so in, in 2010, I mean, that's when I came into the movement. Right. Um, so um, that was, I mean, the presentations then in 2010, we have, uh, in April 2010, we have Johannes Koletsky's paper on Joseph, uh, the chronology of Joseph and the structure there of the chiasms. And then we have the prophetic chain is the main light that's studied in 2010. Um, okay. So, I mean, obviously that camp meeting in Oklahoma was part of what caused friction between Jeff and these other ministries. Um, but there was other things happening as well. Um, but yeah, it is possible it has something to do with it. I don't know specifically what. Um, it's just as far as the word rest, I don't know if that's a good way to translate. Um, uh, well, the other thing is, is that no, it's, it's, it's like, well, a, a release, I think the idea is that they get a holiday. Right. If we're pronouncing that word from the Hebrew, the way that the way that it looks, it's the word Hanukkah. Yeah. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Yeah. Festival of Light. What? Well, which is just a holiday, right? So, um, let me see here if I can find out more about it. Um. Yeah. So giving a holiday giving a rest, a holiday, right? That's from, means to settle down. Okay. Um, but yeah, the idea of a release, it's more release from labor. So, oh, so it'd be, be way better to say he made a holiday uh, for the provinces. But, um, but yeah, it's the word Hanukkah that's later used. But that's you know it, it's just a different holiday. Um, this isn't this isn't Hanukkah. Um, but when is Hanukkah? I mean, it would be in like, is it in the tenth month? Yeah, because I, I, I don't know much about Hanukkah other than it had something to do with uh, uh, the Maccabees, right? It's it was what it was occurring in. No, let me look it up real quick. Yeah, I'm looking it up here in Wikipedia. Um, I'm just seeing if it's spelled exactly the same. Actually, spell it slightly differently. I believe you'll find that it, it should be taking place about the 25th day of the ninth month yeah. and going yeah. for eight days. 
Yeah, so it 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 goes through that period of time because if you start on the twenty fifth, um, so twenty fifth of so the ninth month, so that's going to have um, thirty days. So twenty fifth, twenty sixth, twenty seventh, twenty eighth, twenty ninth, thirtieth. So it's going to go to like the second day of the tenth month. So something like that, yeah. Now it says here that it comes from actually a different word, meaning to de dedicate. Um, what Hebrew word is it? Uh, well, it's it's Hanukkah, but not with the the chet. It uses a kaf to get that k sound. So it's kind of interesting. So so if you look at to twenty ten, it's uh, it's got that ha at the beginning. That's just the, um, and then you have a noon, a het, and then a he. So the het is where you get that Hanukkah, that sound. But Hanukkah has a cough there instead. So instead of that het, so it's just a a harder k sound. So so it's not the same word. Um, well, what we're looking at here is Hebrew 2010. What Hebrew number is the other word? Um, I don't know because I don't think it's in the Bible. So I, I can't tell you. I mean, I could try to figure out, figure it out, um, you know, if there's the, like the root of it somewhere. But... Um, So it would be, be, I don't know. I'd have to, I could try to do it in a search in the Hebrew. Because I can do a Hebrew search, but that'd take me a little bit. Anyway, for now, it, it is kind of interesting that it's a very similar word, though it has a different meaning. Because one means to dedicate, one means to, uh, to give a holiday, um, to make a holiday. Or so to rest, right? Yeah, well, a giving of rest or making a holiday, right? So now it comes from a word that means to settle down or to settle, to rest. So that's the five one one seven number. Okay. Uh, which is related to Noah. Right? Right. Um, which means to rest. Okay. So it's it's related to the to Noah, so that's interesting. Um He made so he made a province. Uh, he made a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts uh, according to the state of the king. I'm not sure what that means. According to the state, it's kind of obscure because that word there looks like hand, right? Yad. So. So I'm not sure what that expression means. According to the hand of the king, or gave gifts from the hand of the king. I'm not sure why they translated this as state. It says memorial in Young's literal and a literal translation. So why Yad is translated as state, I don't know. Well, it's because here it says uh, from the hand from he, the hand of the king, because uh, it's got a cough in front of Yad. Okay, and then when we're looking at this with the state of the king, the digits that we have there, 
would also be 273, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, it's the 327. So we've noticed that before with the word Yad, right, when we were studying in Judges. So it's, yeah, it's 327. It's, it's March 27th as a symbol. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I don't I don't know what to do with that feast thing. I mean, I just put it as part of the marriage, like as far as putting it on the line. So if it's a great if it's a great feast. Is that like the great feast that he held before? Well, I don't know. Um, it's definitely not 187 days. If that's what you're asking. Of course, that's what I'm asking. No. Well, no. There would be no indication that it's that long. Because the word great is just, yeah, it's just gadol. It's just... It's a big feast, right? Big feasts can be different sizes. It's still big. Um, so, yeah, so you're not looking at a 187-day feast. But but the thing that I still don't understand is that when they're gathered together the second time, what that means, the virgins, so in 2.19. Right, so I have no idea what that would mean. Um, if anybody has an idea. You know, one guy guesses that, you know, second time, you know, they're gathered in Susa. But but all that's just guess. I don't I don't know what it would mean that they're gathered together the second time. So how how much of a span of time that would be, I have no idea. So so I mean we're not putting it on the line. I guess that's the that's sort of the point here. We have this gathering together the second time, but I didn't put it on the line, right? So. <clears throat> well, we can establish that the virgins were gathered together the second time after the wedding. Right? Yeah, but how long? Well, yeah, it's after the wedding. But, but how long a time? I don't know, right? So I, I just don't know what it means. I mean, I know they're gathered together a second time after the wedding, but what that particularly means, um, just, you know, they're gathered together again. So what does this gathering together of the virgins mean? So that seems to that information seems to have been lost to us over time. Or that information is, you know, it's something for us to note a an event, but not a period. Yeah. I mean we have the symbol of have anything to do with Nam 1 verse 9 okay no I don't think so okay 
because the question is this because Nahum 1 verse 9 says what do you imagine against the Lord he will make an utter end affliction shall not rise up the second time and and I just don't think that that's related I mean I don't see how it could be but I mean that that number is interesting because it has the digits of uh, um, can't think of his name the constant um, what's the name Capricars yeah Capricars constant right it has those same digits in it but that's in Nahum but the other one doesn't it's a different number. Um, different different meaning of a word. Everything's different there. Anyway, I just don't know what the second time means. What 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 this gathering together is. Um, Hmm. But anyway, I, I didn't know that I could put it on the line as a separate event. But, you know, maybe I could. I just don't. Not sure how how to do that. So when you look at this line, <clears throat> so we have Esther's wedding, and we just have a bunch of things associated with that. We're going to have some feasts. Uh, we're going to have Mordecai uncovering this plot is somehow connected to that in that history because I'm assuming that's happening at that time like I'm not taking uh, taking this as being connected at the time when Haman is there that is the question of is when does he uncover the plot and and Haman's decree the period of time between when he uncovers the plot and Haman's decree when would those be right that's that's kind of the the point that i have with this second time we don't know exactly what it means in in the context of time so are we going to take that story and and keep it at that time or is this going to be much later because the indication in uh, the apocryphal Esther, when, when we look at that in chapter 1, right, they're going to put this story in here uh, along with Mordecai's dream. But that really shouldn't be there, right? So we know it's in chapter 8. Um let me see here. Um, where was it? Yeah, see that that's the thing that's interesting because I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah, okay, go on. Some when they when they've gone through this from the apocrypha, place the apocryphal portion of chapter twelve one to twelve six, which is the entire 12th chapter yeah as occurring after the chapter 2 verse 19 um so chapter 2 verse 19 is is this story that's also in the apocryphal Esther uh, at the end. So the reason why they put it at the end, my understanding is that they just took this, these portions that weren't in the Hebrew and they placed them at the end of the book of Esther. Right. That's how they, they originally did this. That's my understanding. 
They, they do the same with it, the book of Daniel, the apocryphal portions to that, Bell and the Dragon and the other story. We put that at the end of the book of Daniel, which, of course, wouldn't fit chronologically in that way. Um, so that's that. But why they put this here in this version, why they placed it along with uh, chapter 11, doesn't really make any sense. This just seems to be a Greek account of what happens in chapter 2. Well, again, you know, in the studying that that was that I was led to look at the first portion, the chapter 11 portion from the Apocrypha does and can fit with Esther chapter one. Well, because it's in the second year. <laughs> right. This other section, chapter 12, verse one to six doesn't fit there. Correct. So, so we don't really know when this occurs. That's the problem that I'm having because when the virgins were gathered together the second time, I mean, what particularly is this gathering together? Celebration right? of marriage? Well, I don't think it's the celebration of marriage because this is the second time. And then it says, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Um, you know, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people. So that means this is after Esther has been married, of course, right? Um, and then it's just, and then it's going to mention in those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So now that expression in those days, um, it's it's not as um, clear as it would be if you said that in English, because you say those days you're talking about well at that time, right? Okay. Right, but in Hebrew, they don't really have this sense of these and those, right? It just it, it's. It, it's really indefinite because it could be it just says in the days that he sat in the king's gate. This It could be referring to something happening earlier is what I'm trying to say. So, I mean, this could have been earlier. Uh, but they're mentioning the story here. But in this in this situation with Esther two twenty one, yeah, when we are referring then back to the portion of the apocrypha, yeah, it ties back with Mordecai sitting in the king's gate, along with the two chamberlains the two eunuchs right yeah so um yeah so it says here in, in mordecai or mordecai however you say his name mordecaius took his rest in the court with gabtha so that's big then and tara which is teresh the two eunuchs of the king and keepers of the palace, right? Um, so here it says he took his rest in the court. Now, obviously, this is translated from Hebrew into Greek. And um, so they may just in the translation, I mean, this would be he's in the sitting in the king's gate, right? That's the same idea, just a different way of saying it. At least that's the way, way I would take it. Took his rest in the court. I mean, obviously he didn't lie down in the courtyard or anything like that. Um, this is just when he he sits in the king's gate, right? Same expression. Would people agree with me on that? Uh, 
I'll think about that. Is I mean, if we look at at chapter two, um, you know, Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So that's the same idea. The, the idea of the king's gate is the idea of a court. It's interesting when I'm comparing this in the 1769 King James, yeah. the next verse, and he heard their devices. And the, the cross-references there go back to Esther 2.21 and Esther 6.2. Well, in Esther 6.2, it's going to just refer to uh, when they when he's reading this record, right? Of the of Big Thana and Teresh seeking to lay hands on the king. Right. And 221. Which we just read. Which we were just reading. So it, it's giving the, the references. I mean, here is here's Big Thon, Big Thana, however, however his name was pronounced, and Teresh, which yeah. kept the door or kept the threshold, mm -hmm. and that they were angry. Mm -hmm. So we were using this in our conversation yesterday as another point against Haman. Right, because the idea is that Haman um, was involved in that in some way. Right. That's the suggestion, that it wasn't just them, but they're the ones that are caught because they're talking about it. Right. But, but Haman seems to be the one who was directing this in some way. Now, so, so part of the thing about um, Big Tan and Teresh is that um, the question is when this did this occur? Um, because Haman he had advanced in um, later on, right? So we know at this time Haman's not um, important, but it says you know basically four years later that's when Haman is going to be. Um, promoted right so so early on the idea is that you know Haman is involved in this plot um, against Xerxes but later on he's going to be promoted so obviously it wasn't discovered and and we could see the fact that he is promoted probably means that he's been maneuvering within you know, the state uh, to get promoted, right? And it would make sense that he would be involved in this plot. Well, would it not be uh, considered that if Big Than and Teresh were inquired about, if they were, they said that there was inquiry made concerning them. So yeah. my think, my thinking is, that they would, if if Haman was responsible in some way for their in that plot, that they probably would have knew about it, and therefore they would have said Haman. They would have pointed the finger at Haman. Yeah. Okay. So As let's well. say that's possible. So so we don't know all that's involved, but one thing we know about uh, uh, conspiracies like this is um, that there could be, like if you think about how the mafia works, people aren't always going to tattle, uh, even if they're going to face death, because their family also could be affected, right? So, so there might be reasons why they wouldn't point out Haman. Plus, at this time, Haman is not uh, advanced in the kingdom. So Haman may not be the main person behind the plot. He may just be uh, one of the persons behind the plot. 
The point is, in the Apocrypha, it says that Haman doesn't like Mordecai for the fact that he uncovered this plot. Right? But yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking the same thing. If, you know, if Haman was involved, you know, they could say, well, it's Haman, right? To... Yeah. But, See, we but already Haman... have a reason. We already have a reason why mm -hmm. Haman doesn't like Mordecai. Right. In the first place, because he doesn't bite out to him. Mm -hmm. But this, but that's later. Yeah. Right. So, so there may have been an initial feelings towards Mordecai. I mean, that's what it says in the Apocrypha, whether it's, you know, well, it, whether it's valid or not. You know, we've had discussions regarding this because uh, the whole thing about the the apocryphal Esther is you're going to have uh, the decrees described, and then you're going to have this dream uh, described. Um, and, uh, I mean, you're going to have the prayer of Esther and, and things like that, where God is going to be mentioned. So, so this isn't something that you see in Esther. One of the characteristics of Esther is God isn't mentioned in Esther, right? Mm -hmm. So, but in the apocryphal Esther, God is mentioned. So people have theories about, you know, the origin of the apocryphal Esther, where did these this story come from? But I think the account in the book itself um, is is fairly plausible that this is a translation or a paraphrase um, of the book of Esther itself. So this Greek version of Esther. Right. And remember here in the King James, we just have the extra verses uh, put at the end of the book. But if you actually read like a Greek, uh, a translation from the Greek Esther, uh, there's a lot of other little differences here and there as well. Um, but uh, so these are the extra verses that we're looking at. And we don't have them in the Hebrew. But, but that's where, that's how the story's here. And um, the other thing about it is because we have this date, the first day of the first month, right? So if we go back to this chart, um, so the apocryphal Esther gives us Mordecai's dream as being the first day of the first month in the second year. And so we can place that as 9-11. The symbol of the first day of the first month being as, as 9 11. But we also know that Xerxes' planning began on the first day of the first month, and that we put as 11 9, because we know that 9 11 and 11 9 are the same symbol. And so we have this one year period, a regular embolismic year, and uh, that fits in well with what we found as we studied in the book of Judges. So, so it seems to make sense to take this dream as real, even though it's not mentioned in the King James. So what do you think about that, Stephen? Um, yeah, I'm a bit, I don't really know enough about it. It's here, the apocryphal Esther. I haven't really looked into it too, that much, so mm. well, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've read a bunch of, like, I've read the Septuagint uh, version of it. Um, so there are some differences. There's some things like, they put the fourteenth day of the of uh, of the twelfth month for when the decree goes into effect instead of the thirteenth day. Um, so, however that that manuscript survived, because you know we don't have the original Greek manuscript, we have copies of it. Uh, changes were made to it, 
from the Hebrew. So the Hebrew is definitely pure, right? It's not corrupted. The Greek is. But it there's a lot of things about this this story that makes sense. Um, and it doesn't make sense if it was just written later on. So but it but it gives us this date. So whether this date is accurate or not, you know, we have no way of, of proving it or anything, but at least gives us this symbol. And the thing that it does is it gives us this conflict between Mordecai and Haman that, you know, and we already understand the Saul and Agag uh, connection. So it gives us this 609 years. So, so to me, it, it just, it fits as a symbol. So I think that we should use it, Mordecai's dream, because that, that completes the first message. The problem here is the second angel's message. You know, what do we do with Mordecai's uncovering this plot? When did it occur? Um, it definitely didn't occur after Haman had been promoted. But when this plot was uncovered, you know, it says in the apocryphal Esther that Haman was, you know, upset about it, right? So he's he's not happy that this plot was uncovered. And, you know, I don't know, you know, like, let's say if it was made up. I mean, it's kind of a hard thing sort of to guess. But if somebody had made this up completely from scratch, uh, that would that to me is kind of a, a hard pill to swallow. Because what would be the purpose of it? I mean, why would you need to make up these sections of the book of Esther? You have the book of Esther already. You have the story. Why would you need to add, you know, Mordecai's dream to it? I mean, is this some kind of fanciful thing that just is going to be added by a Greek writer? He's going to translate Esther from Hebrew and then he's going to add these stories to it? Or would he have already seen a document that had these stories, but that somehow were excised from the Hebrew manuscript itself for some reason? So, so we don't have, um, so I would also have to probably that uh, sometime after Haman had died that they found out about this here plot that Haman was somehow involved with in it. So we have to sort of think how, how did that occur? You know, how did they come to know this information? You know, exactly. If, uh... Yeah, because the, because the knowledge here is something that's, well, this would be knowledge that we would know from God, right? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, this wouldn't be knowledge that other people would know about, you know, per se, that who are going to write this. So it, so it says he sought to molest Mordecai and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king. So, I mean, the implication here is um, now it says, how, how be it Haman, the son of Amadathia, the Agagite, who was in great honor with the king, sought to molest Mordecai and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king. So it's giving this re reason. Now, it's also in 12 verse 6. So that's. So just as a symbol there, um, you know, even even let's say this story is is apocryphal in the sense truly apocryphal that it's not accurate. 
we still have these symbols attached to it. You know, the book of Esther is going to end with 12 verse 6 if we have the apocryphal Esther. You know, it's going to have two extra chapters, 11 and 12. So 12 verse 6 is going to be the last verse, um, which which doesn't really make much sense why they do it that way. Right, because you, you're going to see yeah, 11 verse 1 is going to say, the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemy and Cleopatra Dosiatheus, who said he was a priest and a Levite, and Ptolemy his son brought the epistle of Purim, right? So it's going to give this story about the translation, but it doesn't put it as the last verse, right? It's going to put chapter 12 verse 6 as the last verse, right? Well, that's... But, you know, it's going to put the story about why Haman sought uh, the death of Mordecai. So so when they put the apocryphal Esther together, they put all of this at the end. So everything that's apocryphal, they're going to add. And I shouldn't say everything, because if you go through here, um, let me see. There is... Right, you're going to actually have these other verses. So other chapters, they're going to put at the end. So I shouldn't say it's the last one. Because you got 16, chapter 16. You have, um, and then you're going to have, so you actually have up to 16 chapters, I guess. Chapter 15. So this is going to be put at the end of Esther. So they place these at different uh, places within the book of Esther. So there's chapter 13. And and then you're going to have more of chapter 13 here. So I guess what they do is they add 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 at the end of Esther. So it ends up with 16 chapters. But but the point is the last the last thing that I would have placed in the book of Esther would be the story of the translation. But they're going to put that, well, as 11 verse 1. And I guess their reasoning, because they're going to add extra verses to chapter 10. And then they're going to have this 11 verse 1. Right? So then they're going to talk about, I guess, the translation of it. And then they're going to have all those other chapters. So why they did it in that way, why they put these verses in that order, um, I don't. I don't really understand. So who, who is it you're? Who is it you're referring to as they? Yeah. Who is the they? It, it's the indefinite. Who, who is, I don't know who they are. Oh, but okay. that that not not be like uh, Stephen Langdon and uh, whoever it was in the 1500s or whatever it put the verses in. So, did they do them verses? In these I'm not so, yeah, I'm not talking about the numbering of the verses. I'm talking about the ordering of the story, right? So, uh, so here I have. I'll show you this. So here is how I look at at Esther. Whoops, that's not the right one. This one here. Okay, so this is Esther, and we have the Old Greek. And we have the alpha. So these are translated from two different sources. And in the old Greek, they're going to start in the second year when Artaxerxes the Great was king, on the first day of Nisa, so that's Nisan, in the one. And then the other one, it says in the second year when Ahasuerus the Great was king on the first day of the month of Adar. So you can see one is, you know, they have Artaxerxes, right? They call him in one. And the other one, they call it Aha. Asereris, so Ahasuerus. Um, and then they're going to have in the other one, um, Nisan, which is Distros Zanathikos, right? So they're giving um, the Macedonian name of the month. 
Uh, the other one, they don't tell you what the Macedonian name is, right? So these are just different sources, and, and they're going to put this story in this way, right? So they're going to lay out the story like this. And so that's probably why in um, – so they put this verse, this story about Mordecai um, finding about these two eunuchs, they put it here before chapter 1, verse 1. So – Whoever they is, the, the, the guy who translated it or whatever, but that's where the story is placed. Right? But you're going to see here that when you read this, this is translated from the Greek. They're always going to call him Artaxerxes in this version and Ahasuerus in this verse, version. Yeah. So, these, so these are old Greek manuscripts that have been translated into English. Um, and, you know, and here they're going to call uh, Vashti Austin or Austin the Queen instead of Vashti, right? So they're going to have, uh, you know, just different names, uh, more recognized names. Okay. So, so that's why we have this situation. And when you get to the end of this document, um, you're going to have these sections that they've added in. Uh, they're just going to number them differently. They're going to call them D, right? So instead of five, so they're they're added out of these parts in. It's, it's rather confusing. Anyway, that's the main thing I'm trying to say. Uh, so why it's ordered in that way, even in the Greek, and um, you know, why then they put these in these places here, because um, here, I'm just, uh, because when you get to this, I'm just sorry, I switched back. But so the last verse in the book of Esther in this uh, original manuscript is going to be um, in the one manuscript. It says in the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemy of Cleopatra, Theseus, who said he was a priest and a Levite and Ptolemy, his son, brought the above letter about Purim, which they said existed, and Lysimachus, son of Ptolemy, one of those in Jerusalem, translated it. So it's just saying that this is a translation from this. But in the other one, which is called Alpha, Alpha, it doesn't mention this at all. So it doesn't even have that verse. Right? So that verse exists in the Old Greek, but doesn't exist in the Alpha version, what they call the Alpha version. Right? So you can see that there at the bottom, right? You got the this verse here, that's 11 verse 1. This version does not have it. So it's going to be the last thing in the book. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, yeah, it's – I know it's confusing, but it's just help trying to understand what's happening in this story. And – and in particular, trying to understand when this occurred as far as the event of him uncovering the plot. Because just, just because it says, you know, in those days, in uh, chapter 2 at the end, it doesn't mean that it's in the days that the virgins were gathered together the second time, right? Because when you get to 2 verse 21, it's introducing a new topic, right? So it just says in Esther 2, 19, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So he's, he's uh, resting in the king's court, right? Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Right. And then it has these last three versions in those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate. 
to the king's chamberlain. So it's just, he sat in the king's gate and is saying in the time when he sat in the king's gate, but exactly when that is, we don't know. The thing about the apocryphal Aster is it places it in the second year of, of Xerxes. That's the way that I take it. And, and could it be that that's when it occurred? Not at the time after Esther had been made queen. But they're mentioning it here because Haman is now going to plot against the Jews. And so they're going to mention the story just before chapter 3. So, so I don't understand what the second time means, and, and I'm not sure how to place that. But also I don't think that the plot story is at that time. It seems to me that it would have been in the second year. So it's just part of this story about the conflict between Haman and Mordecai. So what do we do with this? I mean, <clears throat> so Stephen, what would you do with it? What would you do with this story as far as we we can place it on a line? Um, but is there some way in which we could sort this out? Are you, do you have any ideas or anybody? But Because I've just chosen not to place it on the line. Yeah, I don't have any ideas. Okay. But is it okay if we don't place it on the line? If we just say it's a story that's out of time. That is, it's not, it's not telling us when it occurred. At the, at the very least, we, we can't say when it occurred. Yeah, no, with a certain thing. We have maybe an approximate time span for it to place it. Well, it's sometime when Mordecai and Haman are alive and Xerxes is king. But, I mean, it could be in the second year of Xerxes that this plot is uncovered. That's possible. Yes. Right? So, so there's no reason to take the statement in Hebrew in those days, referring to, in those days, referring to the wedding or the second time the virgins gathered, just in the time that Mordecai sat in the king's gate. That's what it's referring to. That's the days it's talking about. In the days in which he did this, this is when this plot was uncovered. And it, it's a reason, a reason, not the reason, but it, it's a reason that more that Haman sought to harm Mordecai and the Jews, right? That's the reason that's given. But it's it's not the only reason because Mordecai is not going to bow down to Haman. So when we get to chapter three, um, it's gonna it's gonna say that Xerxes now promoted Haman. Right, so it's going to mention this whole story that's in the Apocrypha, that the Apocrypha places in the second year. But it doesn't include that reason, right? It doesn't say the reason why he sought to harm Mordecai. But it puts it there, and it puts it there in a way that it would make sense, the Apocryphal aspect of that story, that that's one of the reasons. It would make sense now where it's placed if it had occurred earlier, why they're placing it there. Because that verse would make sense. If they put that verse there, then 
in, in the King James, if they put that that one verse about, you know, 12 or 6, that Haman sought to harm Mordecai and his people, the Jews, right? And we put it as the last verse of chapter 2. It would make sense, right? It, the story then would follow. Because in the King James, it's there. But in the apocryphal Esther, it's earlier. It's in the second year. So I, I know, you know I'm belaboring this point, but I'm really trying to understand it. To me, it makes sense as this initial problem that Haman has with Mordecai. But the focus then in this story is going to be um, that Mordecai is not going to bow down and give him reverence. Right. So in the King James, the Hebrew, we're, we're going to have the focus upon um, the fact that Haman's now advanced. He's been promoted. And when he goes into the king's gate, all of the servants reference, reference, reverence Haman, except Mordecai. So Mordecai's in the king's gate. He doesn't bow down or, or, get, uh, or give him reverence. And, and the, then the servants, they say, well, well, why? Why are you not bowing down? Right, so let's just show you the verses. <clears throat> just, we got that there. Yeah, that's correct. You're looking at them. Okay, I got this screen wrong. Okay. Um, now, when he, and it, now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told him to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So... So, I mean, the main thing that they're telling Haman here, I mean, obviously Haman would know this already. It's not like Haman wouldn't know it. Uh, but when they bring it to Haman, I mean, they, they want to see what's going to happen. You know, but this guy's not bowing down to you. You know that, right? Um, did you know he's also a Jew? Now, when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Now, so, so in this in this story, the way that we read it here, it's saying, well, Haman now sees this. But I think it's more than just seeing it. He starts he sees the reaction of the other people as well. Maybe he could have put up with somebody not bowing as he drove by. But when this starts to be noticed by others, it becomes a, a point of humiliation to him. I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I don't know how he would know that not know that Mordecai isn't bowing down to him. So any, any thoughts on that point? I'm just thinking about Daniel and Nehemiah, that they yeah. would have reverenced the king, but would they not have bowed down to Nebuchadnezzar or Artaxerxes or so forth? Mm. So in a sense, maybe we should, it's just like a prophetic thing, is it? Or is it a... Yeah, I don't know. We're, we're meant to obey the land, the, the laws of the land, which unless they or against the, the law of God, in a sense, it's... Yeah, I don't know. So there must be something about Haman, though, that, that, that the reason why he's not going to bow down. First, Haman's not the king, right? But it would seem to me that Mordecai has a grudge or something with Haman as well, for some reason. So it's not just that Haman is, you know, because I'm sure that, you know, out of respect people would bow down to other people right it's just you know showing reverence for somebody that's older or whatever but in this case mordecai 
is not bowing down. And, and so there has to be some reason. That is, to me, the reason is it's not clear what's going on here in the King James. Okay, so so that's part of the, the problem that I have here. Now, the one thing that it says in uh, the apocryphal F Esther, uh, Dwight, um, when it talks about this... Um, uh, uh, feast, right? So it says that it's seven days, and you're seeing that where? Oh, it's in the Apocrypha, the old, the old Greek Apocrypha. So it says, when the time was completed for Esther, the daughter of Amminadab, brother of Mordecai's father, to go into the king she turned down nothing of the things that the king's eunuchs the guard of the woman commanded for esther was favored by all who saw her esther went into artaxerxes of course that's supposed to be xerxes the king in the 12th month which is adar in the seventh year of his reign so here they have the 12th month not the 10th month and the king fell in love with esther and she found favor beyond all the virgins so he set the queen's diadem on her then the king gave a wine party for his friends and forces uh, for seven days. He celebrated Esther's wedding feast and gave rest to those under his rule. So that's just what it says in the Apocrypha, in the Old Greek Apocrypha. Uh, the Alpha Apocrypha misses all kinds of verses. It misses um, verses, uh, well, it it has them, but it, it cuts out lots. So anyway, I'm just, just noting it. So, and where exactly had you found all of that? I mean, um, it, it's in the, the apocryphal book I have here. Okay. The Esther, right? The one I showed you earlier. Right. Right. But it's, it's one that is not in, right. I, I see this part, but where was it that you found this book? Just online. Okay. Yeah. It's just it's just the translation from the Greek Apocrypha. Like the the Septuagint. Okay. Um, so I can find out more. But there's lots of different uh, documents. But these are the t I, I'm not sure why they call the one Alpha and why they call the one the Old Greek. But anyway, that's what I have here. So, um, yes, yeah, just in the King James, what they do is they only add parts of the Greek Apocrypha of Esther in the King James. That is, they don't add everything. Um, because they, they keep the Hebrew parts the same and they just add the parts that aren't there. If that makes sense. Okay. Right. So they just leave the, the King James the way it is. And then they added those extra parts at the end. Right. That's what they, that's what they did in the King James. So they didn't put the, uh, Esther in, um, like in the Bible, they would just add those extra chapters. But originally those extra chapters were within the text itself. Right. So yeah, so it's it's rather confusing uh, how they how they did that. Okay, so I don't know if we're getting anywhere, but <clears throat> so when we look at the well, here let's we'll go back to this line instead. So when we look at this line that we've drawn. 
it makes sense that Esther's wedding's the second angel arriving. We have the first day of the 10th month, in the seventh year of Xerxes, December 22nd, 479 BC. But we don't have anything in our line to describe what it is. So this is what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to have to, we're going to have to sort out some of these problems we're discussing. I'm going to try to find out a bit more, but then we're going to have to place those events in our time. So we're going to say, well, December 22nd, 479, what event is that in our history? What way mark is it? Because we have 9-11, 11-9, and July 18th. Right, 2020. So, so we have those way marks already. But we know that the second angel in this story, we have a second angel arriving somewhere in our history, and we'd have to figure out what event that is. What would we line this up with? And then we have to decide, okay, we have Esther's wedding. We're not going to put Mordecai's just uncovering this plot on this line because we don't know where it is. Um, it just seems to be more part of this backstory for Haman's decree. And so when we get to Haman's decree, that's going to be on the 13th day of the first month in the 12th year of Xerxes. But I put there from the 13th to the 16th. So this is going to be this period of time from when the decree is issued to when Esther comes before Xerxes and he holds up his golden scepter, right? So he's going to hold up his scepter. She's going to be pardoned. And um, so we're going to look at these spans of time in a little bit more detail tomorrow as well. Um, so I'm normally marking here in this story, actually, the 16th day of the first month when I count the spans of time, by the way. And then from Haman's decree to Esther's decree is going to be 16, 66 days. Well, more specifically, that's going to be um, from the end of that. So when Esther gets pardoned, so to speak. Then there's 66 days to Esther's decree. And, and we have to look at that, what, what that means. And then we're going to say, well, Haman's decree is going to be the second angel formalized. So we, do, we have to know what event that is in our history. And then we have Esther's decree, this counter decree. And we say, well, what is that in our history? It's the empowerment of the second angel. So. So we have to determine what this whole second angel is about in our history that we haven't determined yet. And then the degree, decree going into effect, what date is that in our history? We know the date in, in this history. Does it, is it line up with the date in our history? And then we also have the fourth angel arriving. So you can see there's a lot of work that we have cut out for us to, to understand this story and to place this on a line properly. And any thoughts before we close? I know I'm, I'm going to finish early here, but just, just to agree with you, we still have a lot of work here. Yeah. But, but you can see things are starting to come into clearer focus by this type of discussion that we're going through here. And, and the thing that I can say about it is um, what, what we are trying to do. So we have this first part, you know, this is going to be about July 18th. But I really do think this next part has to do more with Trump. Even though the first part does deal with Trump, you know, we we placed it in there. But but if I if I look at this story and I'm trying to think of the context of of why we're studying it, we're studying it because we're studying Jan Daniel chapter eleven. 
and particularly the first two verses and trying to understand that. Um, so there has to be something in here that's going to give us information. And we haven't really found it yet. I mean, it's nice to be able to take the, the first message and say, well, that's from you know 9-11 to November 9th to July 18th. That makes sense. Uh, this is because, um, uh, you know, when we look at Xerxes planning and Vashti being deposed, we can see that Vashti being deposed, that this has to do with a people who have rejected the call. Right. And we can see how July 18th is that call. Right. And we can see Xerxes planning in there. Right. To come to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. We can right. see how that to November 9th and, and what has happened there. So so we can we can take that story and we can say, well, this has to do with our movement. But now we know that this is supposed to be giving us information about Xerxes as Trump. And so so this latter part, the second message, must have something to do with that. Right. Okay. So, so, so I don't, ha I don't have the answer yet of what that means. Now there are some symbols in here that we have to take into account. Um, so, um, and so we're going to look at those tomorrow. That 3,290 days is of particular interest to us. Now I put 3,290 days. It's actually, uh, if I do it inclusive, it's going to be this number, which uh, we're going to look at. Okay, so that's what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to try. To, we got that's the last study this week because today's Wednesday, tomorrow's Thursday. And so I'm going to try to get some of this tied up tomorrow. We'll see if we can. We might have to wait till next week to get this finished, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven. We are thankful, Lord, for your goodness and love. And we just ask for um, wisdom as we continue to study these things on our own. We pray for each person. May your angels watch over them. And help us, Lord, um, to understand these things and how they relate to our time. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.